So we almost on time. That's great. So before I start, I just uh, want to ask how many people know about the technical debt? I have heard before coming to this forum. They know about it. And uh, people who know about this, uh, are they taking any you know, steps toward it, towards it? I mean, I'm putting so, but I'm just asking explicitly, are they taking steps towards, you know, uh, at least repaying that or increasing awareness? Whoever has raised their hand, sure. just put the remote there. If, if you are doing that, then keep your hands hand raised, otherwise... Until the session ends? <laughs> not that much. Okay, so there are some hands, which means, but there are some hands which was not up after I asked the second question. So this this session is about the first category who has not raised their hands and uh, who has raised hand but has not probably uh, uh, after second question they have you know uh, their, their hand, hands were down. So it's for them basically. So what I'm going to talk about is basically three things. I hope it's working fine. Yeah. So first thing is technical debt. Second thing is pragmatism in technical debt. And the third thing is technical debt management. So there are three aspects of this presentation. So let's start. So I have three sections. The first section will talk about, I will just cover the very basics of technical debt. So that we don't leave you know, on the other side also. And the second section we will talk about how we can prevent technical debt to occur. And the third section we will talk about how we can repay technical debt if it has occurred in our software. Okay? Maybe Let's start. I'll come to that. Maybe one slide away. So let's start. Uh, what is technical debt? Let me ask you uh, at least a couple of uh, people. I can't ask you everyone, but who wants to define it? Don't look at this definition. Amount it requires to improve the code to the level what it's supposed to be. Okay. Anybody else? So these are uh, non-functional uh, things you do in the in your software to make it. Uh, Add more things like which are not supposed to be an exact requirement. They are not covered in requirement. Things like latest stack, things like uh, you know, new security model, and things like uh, you know speed by using a different uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, the different fixes we do, uh, we have something, we have to fix something. It's not a proper layer for it, but we do it so that we can fix it later after the user. Okay. So, the short sets or work around the... Things. Yeah, that's the best solution, the uh, best definition so far. I mean, I, I'm not saying the other, uh, other definitions were wrong, but it's a simplified version of and it's capturing the essence, okay? So that's what precisely it is, so that the debt that accrues, when you knowingly or unknowingly making wrong or non-optimal design decisions. So the, the important thing to note, uh, to note here is knowing your unknowing. So many times we know that we are taking a not so optimal design decision or architectural decision, but still we go ahead with that because of some constraint. Many times we don't know. For instance, uh, the, the fresh developer or father, I mean, uh, it doesn't need to be a fresh developer, even an experienced developer also do. So they come and they think, okay, this is my way of doing it. And that's probably not the correct way or optimized way. So basically, in very short, whatever the hacks we are adopting, those all are technical debt. Those are contributing to technical So let me talk about uh, this, uh, uh, about uh, technical debt. And I, let me give the analogy in financial domain. So it's very similar to like uh, if, we, if we are uh, swiping our credit card or we are taking a loan, for instance, say home loan. So if we have taken home loan, so what will happen? We have to repay that 
how long are we, are we, for instance, we have a TMI, right? Or if you have a strike or credit card, you have to pay the bill, say, before the deadline. If you are not doing, what will happen? Maybe first, a couple of months, nothing will happen. But sooner or later, somebody will barge in your home and they will take the sex what you have. Right? Very similarly, this is the optimal cost of change. So, this, this if you don't have any technical debt, this is what it will take uh, to change uh, to change uh, the software and it's increasing because the, the complexity is increasing as the software is growing. But if you are incurring technical debt and you are not repaying it, that's the that's the main thing here to know. See, it's, uh, having technical debt is not a problem. Or incurring going into technical debt is not a problem. The more problematic part is we are not repaying it. Or we are keep accumulating it. And what happens is that there is a, in every, any, any debt, any loan, uh, there is a principal component and there is an investment debt. And the problem with the, any kind of a debt is the principal component is always a static thing, always a fixed thing, but the interest is keep, keep growing. And we, we are basically, uh, you know, uh, the interest is basically killing us, not the principal amount. And the, and the technical debt also, interest is growing very drastically because today what, we, what uh, decision we make, all the future decisions are around that decision. So that small decision that we have taken a couple of days back now have their, its roots in a lot of other decisions. So if you want to uh, remove that particular decision, you have to go into multiple places. That's why the interest is growing and that what makes technical debt very uh, not uh, difficult to uh, live with. And what happens here, if you are not repaying technical debt, there is a point somewhere here. It's a bankruptcy, technical bankruptcy. And what it means is that even if you, uh, even if you want to change the software, you cannot do it in fixed frame of time because it, the technical debt has accrued so much that you can't do it because you change something here, something else is there. And it's almost impossible to achieve the goals within a certain time. And that state is nothing but technical bankruptcy. Okay, so to explain a little bit more, I have a game. I'm not asking you to play because we don't have much time. But this is the game uh, the Arlington Mellon University, CMU has designed. What they have done is, uh, it's very similar to our Ludo. But there, is, there are some tweaks. So there, are, there might be a couple of people uh, playing it. So we have to start from here, we have dice, we have to roll, and then based on the number we have to you know, call this. But, and we have to reach here. Who is reaching here will win, but there is a catch. Reaching first is not only requirement or not only you know, uh, winning condition. We have to reach here with, with these tools, with these points. And why it is so? Because, because of these. These are shortcuts. These are bridges. You can start from here and you can take this bridge. From this particular junction you have a choice. Now, either you take this bridge, jump here, but there is a, there is a, you know, uh, caveat in this. What is the caveat? First thing is that you will lose these, you know, downy points basically. The second point is, whenever you roll the dice next time onward, for instance, if your dice is saying, saying 5, then you will uh, not forward by 5, but only by 4, minus 1. So, what, it's, it's, a, it's a very analogous to technical thing. So you can take, you can adopt a head, but it will slow you down. In the, in the moment, in the, that particular moment, you will probably gain something. But in the longer run, you are losing because you have to you know, serve that debt. 
So that's what happens. If you take this page, so even if you have four or say five, you only can go four. And whatever is coming, you have to go minus five. So now I hope you have a little bit of idea of what technical that is. Let's go ahead. The next question is what are dimensions of technical? Uh, before I uh, go to this, uh, before I mean before this open house, some couple of people were discussing there, and I guess you were describing that uh, what kind of uh, problems is there. So there are a lot of multiple languages have been used in the same product, and it's so difficult to maintain. That's a kind of technical debt, which is I can classify under technological debt, and. Similar to that, there are many other dimensions. For instance, for that, that implementation level that design that under which design smells come uh, here. Test that if you don't have test or the sufficient uh, coverage is not there, then that, that means that you have test that. Documentation that, which means if some uh, we, we are keep hearing a lot of uh, questions from the morning, that what kind of documentation should be there and what will happen if uh, some documentation is missing and things like that. So it's, it doesn't mean that we need to have a very comprehensive uh, 150 pages of you know architecture documentation, but some sort of documentation must be there. That's what if you don't have that, which means you have documentation there. And there are many other dimensions of it. For instance, technological data is one, configuration data is another, and many more. Here, one more important thing is which many people uh, do that mistake is they classify or they put defects also in the technical debt category. Okay? How many people? Okay, I will less my part. <laughs> okay, so what is wrong with that? Defects come in your test step. No. Defects are not contributing to technical debt. Full stop. Well, it's not non-functional. I would not uh, classify that. But uh, the, the 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 point is, the defects are visible to the end user. <coughs> if your uh, program is crashing or it's not for, uh, working as intended by the user, it is visible to the user. So so defects are def defects and technical that both carries negative, you know, uh, value. But defects are visible to the end user. Technical data is visible to the developer. Okay? That's why never put defects under technical data backlog. Okay? Defect is definitely the after effect of having technical Yeah, that might be the that might be the possibility. So it may happen that due to technical data you are going into some defects. That could be very much true, but there are many cases. <coughs> Let's move on. So, what are different types of that? So, dimensions and types are a little confusing to understand, but dimensions are like what are the different levels or uh, dimensions are associated with technical that. And types are what are the different uh, scenarios in which it may occur. For instance, strategic that. See, uh, okay. Let let me come. Uh, let me comment on this. See, technologies is uh, we have seen a lot of uh, presentations on technologies on the morning. Technologies are keep uh, coming and keep going. These these are fundamentals. Design, architecture. These are much more fundamental things. They are applicable to all technologies. Their flavor may change. Concrete instances may change. For instance, design smell. A smell might be there in a desktop, desktop application also. A, a, a same design smell might be there on a mobile application also. The difference is that uh, in mobile uh, application there might be a different variations. There might be different types of smells. That might be there, but smell as a fundamental, sorry, smell as a fundamental concept is there everywhere. So the concrete instances might vary, but the fundamental, fundamental, 
fundamental is our same. So static, static is that. This that is like uh, when a startup is starting a new company, a uh, uh, startup has started its operations and they are building some software for instance. And uh, they want to roll out their product as soon as possible. So they won't worry about what is uh, my technical debt. Because what they worry is that uh, our product should come to market you know, as early as possible. So that we start earning money. So this is for existence. Mostly it's for long term and it's known. So they are knowingly doing, they know that it's not a perfect solution and it's not the optimized solution, but let's, let's do it because we want to roll out first. Okay, that's the first type of that. Second is tactical debt. It's also known, but it's short term for quick gains. For instance, I have a release today and I, I know I, I need to do something, a specific thing. And I don't have time, for instance, or the optimized solution I know, but it will take say a few days for me to uh, implement. But I know a shortcut which will, which will take probably two hours. So I'll probably take two hours today, but I'll document it, and maybe tomorrow when I come back, I'll fix it you know, properly. I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a short, I'll take that back, release the version, and tomorrow I'll, I'll repair the back. That's perfectly okay. What's not okay is, and what happens normally is that I'll take that shortcut today, I'll not document anywhere, I'll not tell my colleague, and I'll go back home and you know, I'm done for the day, like that. And uh, after that, after a couple of you know, days or weeks or sprints, somebody will think, oh, who did it? <laughs> And, and now, even if we know we can't fix it because a lot of things have been uh, no, around this particular thing. So we can't you know, uh, just remove this thing and throw it away. That's what happens. But anyways, that's the second type of that. It is known, but it's a short term. Third thing is implemental that, which is unknown. And it's uh, occurring uh, periodically. What it means is that, uh, and the reason is lack of awareness. For instance, a fresher is coming, coming, uh, joining the board, and then he probably don't know what are the best practices, and he he's coding as he used to code in the college days. Okay. For instance, recently I saw a code where uh, magic numbers are used. Uh, magic numbers are like, uh, I mean, they're letters. I hope everybody knows. So, and and sometimes uh, that, that number is used, sometimes that minus, I mean, it's for, for instance, that 10 is the number. So, why 10 is used, nobody knows. And somewhere, uh, that seems the loop is running, so he, the person used 10 minus 1, so he has not put 10 minus 1, he just put 9. So, somewhere it's 10, somewhere it's 9. So, it's a difficult situation for the person who don't know who wrote this. But and he has to dig a lot. I know why 10 and why 9 somewhere. Okay? So that kind of thing could be lack of awareness because you don't know about that. And he will keep doing the same mistake again and again. That's why it's a period. Until unless we go to him and tell him, see, so boss, this is not the right way to do. Probably uh, define your constant somewhere and then use that constant. So one thing I've heard is, let's say, Something like this was done by somebody and the person is no more in company. So what somebody would say that okay, that person, if you've done that, you must have done it for some, some purpose. So don't just that code. That's the uh, <laughs> 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 Somebody else is there. <laughs> 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 yeah. And it's your take more depth than something. Yeah, depends. Yeah, normally yes, yeah, but again it depends on what kind of decision it is and which level it is. So normally the example that I gave you is an implementation that. And the fourth one is inadvertent that, which means that we don't know. Uh, again, the same reason. The only difference is it's a, it's not periodic. It's a once in a while. So they are moved, basically they both are same. Only difference is this implementation that is occurring periodic. Okay. So what is the impact? 
we understood what is technical debt, what are different dimensions and types. What will happen if we have technical debt in our project? The first thing will happen is, so if you are working on, uh, on a project with very high technical debt, your morale will be very down. Why? Because you have to struggle a lot. Because you want to change something, then you don't know who or what is the purpose of this. There are so many dependencies. If you change this, you have to fix in multiple places or places. And, and it's a very difficult one for you. So it's, you always you know, have a fear. What if something is breaking? If I change this, and something else will break. And if the fear is too high, then the moral will go down. Because you don't feel motivated to work. Second thing is the quality. You you'll feel anyway the quality is bad. Why I should you know apply all my all, all my you know gems here? So let's not you know don't waste time here. Just get it done and let me go to home. Okay. So the quality will suffer. And because of that, the software becomes SID software, which is nothing but sunken debt. And uh, and again, what, what, what is the consequence of this is low productivity and high risk. Productivity you can understand, if, uh, both are related with understandability. So if you don't understand, you will struggle to change and uh, it will take more time for you to uh, introduce a change. In the same way, since you don't completely understand this and the whole thing, so it's very likely that you will make some mistake. So it's a high risk also. So these are the consequences or impact on your project if you have high technical debt. Okay. This is that was the first section. So we covered very basic things of, about technical debt. So we understand that uh, we should you know, not incur technical debt now. Now the second thing is Second section is about how we can prevent ourselves as well as our team to not incur technical debt. So there are two things in prevention. First thing is awareness. And second thing is process. Awareness is like, do you know about, or you in the sense you and your team, know about technical debt, different types, different dimensions, what may go wrong if it's accumulating so high. <coughs> you know, whether you know code quality uh, practices, best practices, uh, design smell, test debt, uh, and clean code practices, and many more related you know, uh, things. If you don't know, then you need to, uh, you in the sense you and your team, you need to make them aware. That's the very first step towards the prevention. And how you can how you can increase awareness? There are many ways. For instance, you can arrange trainings. You can have workshops, something like this. And very importantly, lead by example. You know about technical debt, and you are, for instance, you are an architect, and you're supposed to know about technical debt. So, you need to set an example that how you design well and how you tackle technical debt. You need to show them that you actually care about it. When, when a senior person is following, then it's very likely that other people about it will also follow. Okay? The second thing is process. And by process, I mean uh, we need to bring process to bring discipline, uh, employ process to bring discipline. And uh, here I would like to talk about pragmatism. See, any process will not work. If, you, if the process itself is very hectic or very time consuming or non realistic, then people will not follow. People will try to bypass it, some either this hack or that hack. 
Okay. So what it means is we need to bring pragmatic processes. Processes should be in such a way that they are flexible, they are uh, feasible in real world. And what I mean by process here, I mean either review process. So you might be following review processes like code review, test review, design review. And it should not be just for the sake of process. So uh, for instance, uh, you might be knowing that uh, 4i principle in code review. It looks like anybody anybody know about a 4i principle? 4 i principle? 4i principle? Code review? No? Okay, so what it means is that uh, if you have wrote it, then you have to send it to at least somebody, at least one more person to get it reviewed before you check it. So that's the phone I use for. But what people do, somebody was joking that I have a spec. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my default phone I use for. <laughs> okay, so the intent here is that just for the sake of uh, process, you should not be having a process. The process should be feasible and in effect, effective processes must be there. Okay? And the, and the second process uh, example that I am putting here is architectural governance, which is nothing but a to collection of guidelines. For instance, you might have a coding guideline in your organization or in your project. So you must follow that. Or, for instance, a code should follow the intended design and architecture. You should not violate the intended design. So, for instance, if this architectural component only supports to talk to that architectural component, and you should not try to escape this and you know, cause this, talk to this and then talk to this, and should not violate. So, those are the processes that are uh, there to govern that, that whether you are following all the intended design and architecture or not. But we live in a very non-ideal world. So what it means is that there is in, the, in this world there is not even a single software, a single useful software without technical. All software has but some or other technical. And if we have that, then we need to repay. But we need to repay in a very pragmatic. That's my only no, uh, point here. I mean, people talk about that you should pay, but it's not like that if you have a list of, say, for instance, uh, a set of designs now detected in your code, that it doesn't mean that you go stop your do uh, development, feature development, and you start you know, removing all those smells. That's not feasible. That's not climatic, that's not even recommended. And that's not going to happen actually. So what are the different ways? So this is this section will talk about two things. First thing is about tools, and second thing is about uh, what are the different strategies that we climatic strategies that we can adopt to repay technical debt if we have technical debt. So this is what I was saying, that debt is inevitable. And we can't escape uh, with the technical debt. The only thing we, we can do with debt is we can manage it. And important thing is we need to be diligent. Diligent in the sense we need to care about it. And we need to be pragmatic about it. That's what I was saying that if we have a sort of coalition, we cannot stop our development work and start repaying technical debt for a year. It's not possible. And it's not recommended also. So next I'm going to talk about some tools that play a critical role in this whole uh, technical debt repayment. And then the next uh, next subsection I'll talk about some strategies how we can uh, take it up this uh, technical debt related uh, issues. So what is the role of tools? The positive side is that they produce uh, 
these are very tricky. So, you, so I mean, since it's, everything is automated, so you give the code and it will generate a set of correlations very quickly, maybe in a few seconds, at the most in a few minutes. They bring out unknown issues, unknown aspects. So some of the problems that you might already know with, with, with your project, but there might be many other things that you might not know. For instance, take uh, architectural smells or design smell. You might know a couple of smells. For instance, you may know that this component and this component has certain dependency. But there might be many other types of smells that you might not aware of. And so these tools help you identify those aspects, unknown aspects. And in the present world, there are a wide variety, variety of tools available. So you, what you can do, you can choose uh, what you need from this uh, available set of tools. On the flip side, you need to keep tools as indicators, tool results as indicators. So if tool result is saying that this, these are the smells or these are these are the metric quality, <coughs> so it doesn't mean that you need to take it literally and you just you know defect at any cost. Because your context is really important. You know much better than the tool what is your context <coughs> and whether that particular structure is actually a smell or not. Okay. And not every tool is useful for you. There might be thousands of tools, but you know what is what you need. So you need to choose. It's not that every every other tool you need to procure and you need to use in your development. Very important message is strive for quality, not numbers. And typically this is the message for the managers, because managers would like to see all green color, everything green. Don't strive for numbers. Numbers may lie. I'll just share you a very quick, uh, quick uh, uh, instance. So what happened is, uh, I, we do a lot of uh, code assessment and design assessment, even architectural assessment. So, in, uh, in, uh, oh, by the way, I have not introduced myself. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so I, I work for Siemens r &D, so, uh, when, when well, one of, in one of the projects, when we reported a set of issues, so they said, okay, so this metric is beyond and uh, going above the threshold, so okay, they, and especially the psychological complexity was going up. So they just made small, 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 small things without thinking. This is not which, uh, this is not we want. Don't strike for number. Obviously, the number came down, but still, that the uh, software is still in a bad shape. The quality is not improved. Maybe that particular metric might have improved, but in general, the quality has not improved. So, strive for quality. Look what is uh, what is best for the product. Uh, how we can improve the quality. Numbers will automatically come down or go up on based on the quality. Tools produce data and we, and we need insights. So you just need to run the tool, get what they are indicating, interpret they are putting our context in the place, and then see what is what what we can refactor or what we can use, how we can use that information. Okay? So still that that critical part of uh, interpreting the tool results and actually taking it up and adopting those uh, things are still with us. Don't give it to the tool. At least in the present set of tools are not capable enough to precisely tell you that what what is smell, what is good design and what is bad design. There are a lot of false politics. Yeah. It's not for, about false politics. See, the point is that you might have intended something. And in your context, that particular decision is right because anyway, design and architecture is always about trade off. In the morning session, uh, uh, he was talking about that, right? So it's always about trade off. So you want to gain something, you need to do something else. So, so in your context, you 
uh, and in many many a cases in software design and architecture, there is no perfect solution. That's why we need to talk about trade-offs. And if we have applied our thought process to come to a decision, and we thought that that we will we will do like this, and the, but the tool is saying other way, we need to nail that finding. Because we know that in our context that smell, although the tool is reporting, but it's not affiliated. We can ignore. So I'll just mention some tools, but I will not go in detail. Uh, for comprehension tools, we can use Magic and Structure 101. For predict code location metrics, we can use uh, independent designer for both as for C-Sharps, including for c sharps and Java, senior for code duplication, understand and design for metric tools, they are metric tools. So now tools are being scale for technical data quantification and visualization. We can use, for instance, Scout and JDO and B sharp and Eclipse. I'll share these slides with you, so don't worry. It will come to you. I will, since the design smell thing is really near to my heart because I wrote a book on design smell. So I'll talk about design smell detection tool in a little bit more detail. Okay? So this is inclusion. How many people will use C plus or Java? Okay, this is for you. So this is a tool uh, which reports a lot of uh, design smells. I provide visualization of these and these. There are some key figures, there are some design smell detected. It also has some classification. And uh, you can you can go to directly double click on the smell and you can directly go to the code which is you know con contributing to that particular smell. Is it static answer? Yeah, it's a static answer. Yes. Both the tools that first one, this is the first tool which I'm talking about. Both the tools are static answers. And uh, free version, not free version, trial version is available uh, for 15 days like this from now on. Uh, and you can, you can try it out. This is the first tool. It's a little bit on expensive side, it's, uh, I think 1000 euros. In the, <laughs> the second. <laughs> it's not bad, it's not so good, then it's easy to learn by. The second one is uh, design line. This, uh, how many people use C-Sharp? Rafun. So, this is for C-Sharp. So, I have a sh very short video also. So, I will probably run this video. Okay. So, so what it means is if you have poor design quality, and when we talk of design quality, we mean understanding the flexibility and so on. Then you have design that and uh, okay, and you need to you need to identify design smell and defect there, and here you can do that. So you, what you need to do, you just need to select the solution file. It will uh, give you all the projects in that. Select what project you want to analyze. Okay, uh, and if you just say analyze, it will analyze. Uh, no, it's, it's coming from this video. So, it will tell you many key figures here, some graphs, detect, uh, detected metric collection and design smells, some more project specific figures. If you want to go in detail, you can go to say class level metrics, it will show you the class level metrics and what it means and some threshold values. All the red ones are the violations. Similarly, you can also go to master level metrics and you can obviously sort and look at it and you can probably be the first candidates for defecting. The similarly, uh, if you click on abstraction smells, it will show you all that abstraction smells. You just click on that and it will show you why, what is that smell and why the tool is detecting that particular smell. And by the way, this particular this tool is using uh, classification which we propose I mean, in our group. <coughs> so this is why this tool is really near to our heart. Obviously, right? Yeah. 
So I hope this is the last one. And then, yeah, you can see that it's a detective white a variety and these many subclasses are there. And you can also export the, for instance, if you want to send the data to your manager, for instance, so you just uh, export the whole thing in an Excel sheet and you can send that Excel sheet to whoever you want. It also provides dependency structure mapping, so you just select which project and it, this is the great thing because granularity you can select which are, what granularity you want to see the dependency. So you can see on types, namespaces and project. So for instance, right now the types are selected so it's identifying like this. So, so it's saying that which entity is depending on which other entity. Similarly, namespaces and uh, so these are the namespaces dependencies. Similarly, if you click on uh, a projects, that it will also show which project depends on what other project. So something like that. So I think this this one is not so expensive. I mean, although it's not, not expensive for you, but, uh, but this one is even cheaper. I think 250 plus local uh, So that was about tools. Excuse yeah. me. If you are done with tools, what are the other softwares considered when you are analyzing on this? Or something like that? the FX cost comes out of the box. I mean, that one, how would you already analyze it? Uh, I yeah. have a presentation uh, uh, which you can directly go to designsmoves.com resources section. Uh, there is, I uh, recently uploaded uh, one presentation on tools to identify and uh, address techni technical debt in which a lot of tools are mentioned. So, as for instance, FX or Sonar Cube or many other tools they, I have yes, listed. Hmm? Cast, yes, cast. Uh, not that one. I have not listed there, but yeah. I mean, so then you went to the technology specific tooling. Right? Yeah, I, I, I what, how I did is that I have three categories: one for C plus one for C sharp, and for Java. Because uh, what, wherever I go, normally people ask about these three languages, so so I have categorization for that. So you can look at that and you can download that, even spread that, no problem. So this section is about. This section is about when we have technical debt, how to address that in a much more fragmented way. So I have eight strategies to, to tackle this situation. The first one is identify, document and track. That's the first step. So to identify you need to use probably some tools, you can also use manual expertise, for instance senior developers or architects may contribute to that. But uh, the usage of tools is highly recommended because they will, the tools will give you the uh, no, complaints in this. So you need to know what, where you stand basically. So what are the different types of issues you have in your mood, that the first step. Second step is uh, you need to document it, maybe you can use software something like TeamScale which is uh, quite sophisticated kind of thing uh, where you can track each individual item. Or you can have probably a simple Excel sheet. Just have all the technical debt items listed. Importantly, you need to track it. Whether you want to handle it or handle it in the sense you want to fix it or not. If you want to fix it, who will do it? When he will do it? So that kind of information you need to track it and once it is done then you need to close that ticket. Very similar to how you do it for the defect. Very similar to that. That's the first step. Second, second step is we need to prioritize. Not every smell or not every technical debt item we need to close or we need, we need to fix. There are many uh, items and many uh, issues that we can probably live with. And how we decide that? We need to uh, see factors such as potential impact on of the smell and the project and context. If it is a, if it is, uh, for instance, if the smell is in the core which is very regularly getting modified, then it's, it's much more apt for you to fix it. But if the smell is being reported in a component which nobody is touching, then probably it's not a 
until unless some, some future requirements are going to come in there. So you need to decide which item you need to uh, fix, which item you can take care. Very importantly, it's okay to live with some debt. Some, sometimes it, it's, uh, the impact of the debt is not very severe, then you can uh, give a lower priority, you can fix it later, then it, so it's a very lean time, probably you can fix it that time. So, but you need to prioritize, that's, that's the only point that I want to make here. Next thing is uh, amortize. Let me go back to the financial loan. So for instance, if, for instance, if I have taken a home loan, I don't have, for instance, if I have taken a home loan for say 25 lakhs, I don't have the whole uh, 25 lakhs in one shot, so if I can't pay the whole sum in one day or even in one month. But what I can do is, I can pay the EM because I am a salary person so I can pay the EM. So that is feasible for me. Same thing, same concept apply in technical debt. You cannot repay the whole list of technical debt issues in one spin or one release. Choose, prioritize all this right and, and uh, select a couple of them in each spin if you are using a jail or in every iteration basically. So take a few items in every iteration and try to fix it. Okay. Motivate and reward. I mean, uh, one of the uh, I, one of the person I was hearing recently, he was saying that there are no technical issues. All issues, the root cause of all issues are technical issues. Behind everything, I mean, technology and whatever uh, new things are coming, we can learn. That's not the issue. If some bug is there, when some defect is there, we can we can fix it. But if you analyze the root cause, every even technical problem will face that, we can face that to people. Because some understanding, some communication gap, something gone wrong on people front, that's why that particular thing is coming. So what it means is that when when it comes to technical debt, if you are uh, a manager or a senior person and you only talk to your data that see, in your, uh, in your uh, performance appraisal, I will only consider how many lines of code you wrote and what you <laughs> <laughs> then what he'll do? The whole year he'll try to he'll try to create a lot of lines of code. Even if he one line he it's required, he'll write four lines. <laughs> and he'll only focus on he's only focus only on writing four lines. Lines of code. But if you say doing things is the minimum that I expect from you. And I also expect that how well you do. The quality also matters to me. If you are a manager and you are telling me your subordinates, then it's a different game. Not only will complete the task, but he will also focus at least to some degree how well he is doing, at least to a quarter he knows. So for that you need to motivate people and reward him. Somebody said that people care about things that you measure and you, and you reward. So if you are not rewarding and you are not measuring, then people will not care. You may relate this to your own organization and I am sure that it, it's everywhere that people or the manager specifically, they, they focus on features. I need four features or these many features in the next sprint or the next situation. They don't say that, you know, I need these things but with high power. Maybe not, you know, perfect quality. I'm not talking about perfect, perfection. But a decent quality. If, you, if manager started doing this, then it will change the game. Boris Kauf rule. What it means is that when, uh, I mean, it's used in the scouting. So when, when a set of people are going to, to some, uh, some place, 
when they are leaving that place, they make it, uh, they leave the place in a such a way, in a much better way than they got it. Same concept apply in software. When you when you are modifying something, you only really have to test it since you are modifying for some reason. So I'm not to test. I mean, uh, I mean, in addition to what you are doing, you clean up that particular code. At least whatever the part you are touching, that you can clean up. And you only really have to test. So it's not an additional burden uh, for you. So that's essentially the voice scout rule and that's what people keep saying that continuous refactoring uh, is, is your, it should be your you know, uh, mood mantra. Periodically aim for large scale that we can Let me go back to financial domain. So, so for instance, the same, uh, same example, if I have a home loan and I'm paying EMI, but, for instance, once in a year I get some bonus from my company. So at that time, if I have a, say, a decent amount in addition to my EMI, so I can pay that additional amount to you know, uh, decrease my debt. The same way, you need to choose a high uh, gain item which is probably say for instance architecture refactoring and you might be responsible for a component and there might be a many other component and you, if you want to take up that refactoring you need to not only change you, your component but maybe some more other component has to be changed if that is the case then you need to do it first of all once in a while because and since it's a high gain, high risk gain you need to plan a lot and you need to communicate a lot because if you don't plan it well it may go other way also so, so you need to uh, consult to your corresponding partners and you need to take them to you know, confidence and but you need to do it because they although it's a high risk but it's a high gain also you will gain a lot by that bigger big ticket item so once in a while do that also. Repay that horizontally, not vertically. What it means? We have seen that there are many dimensions, like uh, code that and design that and test that and so on. So one way is like you choose a set of, uh, you have a set of uh, static rule violation for instance in code that and you start fixing one by one. The other way is horizontal, uh, uh, which means uh, which means you take an entity, for instance a component or a file or a class, and fix all the smells related to that. That is much better. Why? Because these are these dimensions are interrelated. For instance, if you want to make uh, the, the 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 code or the, the class uh, you want to increase the coverage, it's, it's probably required for you to change the design. In the same way, if you want to change the design, it's likely that you need to write more test cases. And similarly, code and design also go hand in hand. Many times to make a small change, you need to make a little bit bigger design change. So the recommendation is you target horizontally, not vertically. And the last one is, don't repay that in certain cases. This should not be the excuse, okay? And you just take the print out of the photo and show it to your user. <laughs> you should not do this. You should not do this in certain cases. If it is a prototype, or if, it, if the product is going out of life, or you have already planned a migration for the product, then probably it's okay. You don't pay in those cases. That's a very good point. Yeah. Just like, I can share a good example here. So we have a product which is like a desktop product, swing based product. And we are working on a next generation product which is one best company. And uh, senior directors are pushing us like anything to, to actually add features into the previous one because it's being used. They say, wait for some time, all these things are coming here. If you do it here, you can plug in you know, to the same thing here. 
it is not does not mean that uh, the product is not visible, but uh, we just we are delaying it to so that we can fix it. Number two, place which has a better design and. Uh, so that's also important, and as as we were mentioning, that it is actually uh, very uh, useful in real world scenarios. So that's it. What I would like you to uh, take it from here is that technical debt have three dimensions that we have discussed today. One first one is we need to understand understand technical. We need to try to prevent it in our organization in our teams. And if it, is, it has occurred, then we need to detail. One message that I would like you to take from this session is that we need to be pragmatic and we need to be diligent about technical work. Okay. And uh, this is our book, Session this Promotion. So if you have not read it, please read it, buy it. And if you have read it, then recommend to your uh, and if you are read it, please write a review on Amazon. You can find a lot of resources here, designsmills.com. It's our site. We are maintaining it and we keep writing a lot of articles. Uh, I'm just doing some social service there. So just it's a free material. You can download it, you can distribute it. And these are my details. If you want to get in touch with me, feel free. I have um, any question for me? You don't need to. Oh, I'll take a picture. Uh, with respect to design smell, right? Um, how do you deal with difference of opinion wherein you have thought of some way and some other person has thought of it in some other way and that person is not there in the company anymore? <laughs> so, th most of the times we work on products which are already developed and left and, uh, left and gone. So, how do you deal with such kind of situations? This is not a technical issue actually. You may have your, see the design is so um, fuzzy in nature. So it all depends on how you present it to your manager or your stakeholders. It's not a technical issue. You need to have some technical backing. Okay. So this, this is what you think and this is why you think this is a smell or it's not a smell either way. But uh, this is, I feel it's not a technical issue all depends on the technical leadership. For instance, if you are an architect, then it depends on you more. If you are reporting to a technical architect or any architect, then it depends on you and him, discussion between you and him. Any other question for me? Before we close? No? Okay. Thank you.